Okay, hello and welcome. I'm Jason Gumpert from msdynamicsworld.com, and we're here for a new session in our Spring 2015 Financial Automation Webcast Series. And today I'm happy to welcome a new speaker for us, Blair Hurlbut. Uh, Blair is, an ERP, is the ERP uh, team lead at Catapult, where he works with uh, customers deploying Dynamics NAV, Ceramic Navigator, and Acumatica. Uh, and we're always glad to have another expert from the Catapult team joining us. We've had uh, several in the past as well. Before we get started today, I'd just like to recognize our financial automation uh, webcast series sponsors. Thank them for their support of msdynamicsworld.com. They are Perceptive Software, Metafile, Docstar, Bottomline Technologies, and Avalara. So as we get started, please note that you can use the Q&A block or the chat that you'll see on the right side of the webcast session today uh, to ask your questions and provide your thoughts. Blair will be making time for questions uh, throughout the event. So uh, without further delay, uh, Blair, let me hand it off to you, and make sure you're off mute. All right. Yep. Thanks, Jason. Everyone hear me all right? Okay, hello, and welcome to today's webcast, everybody. I'm Jason Gumpert from msdynamicsworld.com, and we are here for a session on building dashboards with Microsoft Dynamics GP. Uh, today's speaker is someone who probably needs little introduction to many of you. Mark Polino is a Microsoft MVP and a GP veteran who has uh, been an active voice in the GP community uh, for quite a while as, as a champion of the product, also the professional community and the user community. It's always a pleasure to have Mark back. He's a returning speaker for us, and um, I think it's especially nice to have him back for a topic that gets as much interest from our readers as this one does. We had a great response for this session. So as we get started, I just want to add a couple notes. First, I, I do want to just recognize our, our site sponsors for BI Webcasting. Those are, they are de facto, Jet Reports, and Solver. And second, uh, we do welcome your questions and comments today during Mark's session. We recommend you use the Q&A block uh, that you should see to the right of the presentation window. And uh, you can use that to enter questions anytime. Mark will be making time uh, during the session uh, to take questions. So uh, Mark, without further delay, uh, why don't I hand it off to you now? Let me unmute you. Oh, there we go. Thanks, thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. We're going to have some fun looking at uh, some BI stuff around Excel and all the cool things. It's nice to see the uh, the three sponsors. I've used all of their products, and they all do a great job. So um, that's that's going to make this even more fun, I think, as we go along. Um, this, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, if, uh, if you get a minute, tweet, blog, update Facebook, let folks know you're here, you're having fun, you're playing around with dashboards and, uh, and doing something cool on a uh, Thursday afternoon here. And then this presentation, a lot of it we're going to actually be live inside of Microsoft Excel, but if you want some of the basics, there's some reference stuff up here. Um, it's also available now at dynamicaccounting.net, which is my website, a lot of stuff around GP, dynamicaccounting.net slash presentation. All right, so let's get rolling. Um, for many folks, what happens is someone at the C-level, CFO, CEO, um, someone like that says, I'd like a dashboard. I was visiting with one of my CFO friends. They run their whole business off of a dashboard, and I want one. And, you know, as, as an accountant or as a financial person, if you want to help, you say, great, what would you like on your dashboard? And the most common answer is, I don't know, but I'll know it when I see it. And so that's really what leads us into Microsoft Excel as a great place to start building dashboards. Uh, it's because of its flexibility, its ability to connect into GP to be able to pull data out. It's a great starting point to figure out what actually folks want on their dashboards. So I'm not suggesting maybe that Excel is the be all and end all, or that you know 10 years later, that's still where you will live. Some companies feel the need to grow into tools like Jet Reports or Facto or BI 360 from Solver. So all of those are fantastic. Excel becomes a great tool to start with because most folks already have it in-house. And then you can figure out what you actually need so that if you do decide you want to go look at a tool, you're not, um, you're not coming from a point of nothing. You're not starting from zero. You actually can say, here's my Excel dashboard. Here's what I want it to look like. Here's maybe where we're having a challenge. Here's where Excel works really well. So it's a great starting point. Today we're going to look at 
kind of what should be, how you figure out what should be on your dashboard, where do you find the data, how do you kind of get started, and then we're going to build this dashboard while we're here, and we'll spend a minute or two talking about what's good about it and what's bad about it. All right, so it looks like we've got one person maybe with no audio. Um, Jason, I'm assuming that you're still hearing me and that we're still kind of doing okay, right? Yeah, I do, and I'll, I'll reach out to that person to, to try. All right, me. good, just making sure we didn't have a bigger issue. Great. All right, so when you're thinking about a dashboard, um, you really need to be thinking about small, well-defined requests for information. This gets even more important when you start looking at making it mobile and making it available to people on their smartphones. Um, but even on the desktop, this is a dashboard, it's not a report. We don't want something that is 300 pages long. We want to distill this into a nugget of information that can be used to help make a decision around our business. Um, while trends are important, I don't necessarily need to show a three-year chart on a dashboard. Um, you know, what happened two years ago is probably irrelevant at this point in time. If I'm making decisions, I care a lot about what's going on in the immediate, um, maybe in the immediate past or what we're predicting for the future. So you want to look at information that is kind of small, well-defined requests. You want your information to be timely, but you've also got to put a box around that. So as we start to look at this, we'll play with maybe the last 90 days, something like that. Um, Another piece that becomes important is where do I get this information? So if something is available some other way in GP, but maybe it's hard, that's a great thing to think about sticking on your dashboard because, because that data already exists. It's coming from somewhere, and either you can figure out where it's coming from or you can get some help so that maybe now you no longer have to run a 300 report to pluck that number off the bottom. You can just take that number and make it appear on your dashboard. Those are great places, uh, great pieces of info to stick on your dashboard. And then I want to think about the amount or volume of information. So, for example, um, if you you want to limit some things to like top five, top ten, those kinds of things, we don't necessarily want to show every customer and their available balance. That's a report. That's not something that ends up on a dashboard. All right, so we're going to build a dashboard here. The vast majority of initial dashboards that are in organizations are either financial or sales. That's just the way it works, two very important parts. They're two parts that can be very data or information heavy. Everyone wants to know information about sales, how we're doing, how do we improve them, and everyone wants to know information about financial position, what's our cash like, what's our cash flow look like. So those are two, two places that people start almost all the time. We're going to start with a sales dashboard here. We're going to look at our sales by customer, by item. We're going to look at a couple of customers over time. We're going to look at individual customer and its trends, so we're going to predict into the future a little bit. And then we're going to look at item sales over time um, to get an idea of what our item mix might look like. From a timeliness standpoint, this one is going to come directly out of GP, so it's effectively on demand, um, but well, in previous day or something like that, that's not going to affect the type of information we're looking at here. So that should be fine when you're looking at something like uh, previous month or that type of thing. And then we're going to do a lot of top 10, and we're going to do a lot of last three months, last 90 days as we build here. All right, so step one, when you're thinking about um, building a dashboard is to put away your computer, go over to the copy machine or your printer and pull out a white piece of paper because that's probably all the paper you've got in your office. Set it down and draw out what you think you want on your dashboard. This can be ugly. You're not going to show it to anybody um, unless you manage to save your company like a billion dollars and then you're going to frame it so you're not going to care what it looks like at that point in time. It looks like chicken scratching but you manage to save your company a ton of money that's one of those sort of mythical stories that we'll tell down the road. I've drawn mine out on paper. You'll see it's pretty ugly, but this is kind of what we're going to look like. We've got um, customers. We've got items. We've got some controls in the middle. A bigger chart for our customers down here. So I've already kind of taken that step. This is what our ugly, uh, this is what it looks like ugly and drawn out. We'll make it prettier when we're done. 
All right, so we're going to draw it on a paper. We're going to list the requirements. So I need customers. If I want customer sales, I need customers. I need sales. I need dates all around that, that type of thing. You're probably going to have to figure out just a little bit of is this header or detail. And by that I mean if I look at, um, for example, a sales transaction in GP, all of the stuff at the top and the bottom are headers, and all of the stuff in the grid in the middle is a detail. So if I just need sales by customer, all of that exists in a header. So I can go get that off of a, um, off of a spot that just has header data. If I want to drill down into detail, then I actually need to go and grab that from the grid in the center. And we'll look at that a little bit more as we, as we dig into this. Um, reuse existing resources. We're going to do a lot of this. So we're going to start with sales line items, and we're going to use that over and over and over again because not only does that um, work really well, it makes your, your underlying data for your dashboard much, much faster. And then we're going to iterate regularly. Uh, the beauty of business intelligence and dashboards is that you're never done. As soon as you get something that people like in your company, the business will change, and you'll end up having to do more work. Um, if there was ever a job that offered full employment forever, uh, BI is one of those possibilities because the type of information people want continues to grow and change both as the business changes and as you learn more, of, as you get more information, then you want more and you want different pieces of it. So this is the kind of thing that really can, can keep you busy for a really long time. All right, so we're talking about a dashboard and a GP. Um, we're going to start with a refreshable Excel report. I've, I've done a ton of these. I've worked with a lot of people. There are other places where you can start, but the reality is the refreshable Excel report is the place to start. So the refreshable Excel reports, let me share my desktop for just a second here. The refreshable Excel reports exist inside of Dynamic GP. You have to have GP 10 or higher. Um, and so the vast majority of at least 10. So here's my Excel report. I can double click on an item uh, like this. Whoops. Actually want mine. There we go. Sorry, my Excel's coming up a little. We'll get rid of that one. Takes just a second, pulls this item into Excel, and then we we will have a ton of data directly in Excel. If I get rid of a bunch of this stuff, oops. and then come up and do data and refresh all. We'll go back out to Excel and bring in the latest data again. You see it's running a background query here, so it's running a background refresh. It's going to bring that data back in again. So the idea is I can export it from Excel once, or from GP once, and then I don't even have to go back to GP. I can just use Excel as my, as my core and just keep getting the data out of GP. All right, so let's come back here for just a minute. Um, the refreshable Excel reports in GP run on built-in views. So what happens is um, ultimately we want to be able to use these views as a starting point. Now as you grow and get a little better at this, we'll modify these views along the way so that they're a little more efficient. But these underlying views is really what, this is really what you're using to grab the data out of GP and stick it into Excel. Um, and then lastly, um, you may have to go to, the views already have the tables connected and joined, so you don't have to go and do a whole bunch of table joins and figure all of that out. Again, as you get a little better and maybe you need some more obscure you may have to go join to a, to a particular table. But the beauty of this is, is once you get started, if you need a little help, typically your partner will be a huge resource for this. The community is a huge resource, as well as if you've got any SQL guys in-house, 
this is the kind of thing that, you know, you need 20 minutes of their time or half an hour of their time, and then you're kind of off and running. So it's not something where you need them over and over again. All right, so a couple of resources um, as you start looking at where you're going to get your data from. I've got an Excel-based table reference that has all of the tables in it, should you decide to need to go to the tables. Um, it's in Excel. You can download it. It's free. Um, really, this slide is a big reason to go and grab the presentation. Um, Victoria Uden and then a site called Microsoft uh, Dynamic CP Table Reference also both have great online table references. So if you just need to find something in, you know, where does a particular field exist in GP, both of those are great because you can just pop online, grab it, and go back to work. And then both the support debugging tool and then built into GP, the Dynamics GP resource um, descriptions are very helpful kind of once you get beyond those initial views. The actual views from the refresh reports are really, really simple and easy to work with. All right, so let's build something. When we build in Excel, we're going to use the same tools over and over and over again. And you'll see this when you see other people build things as well. So we're going to do pivot tables, groups, conditional formatting, spark lines, charts, and slicers. Those six things over and over and over again. All right, so let's see. Let me share here, and we will take a look at this. So this is our refreshable Excel report that we dropped into Excel. I don't really want to use, I really don't like bringing the data into a, um, into a tab here because honestly, it, I'm using up a bunch of space in Excel and I could actually, if I get beyond a couple of hundred thousand, my pivot tables are going to get slow. But even without going to anything special like pivot, power pivot, there is a better way. So I'm going to do this again. Inside of GP, if it shows data connection, the direct report to the SQL, that's a direct connection will do. If it shows a report, in most cases, that's the view has been slimmed down with, with fewer fields. So we want as much as possible for this. So I'm going to go to two sales line items. Hey, Jason, I'm getting some typing in my in my audio, and so I don't know if other folks are hearing that as well, but I just thought I'd mention that. Okay, sorry about that. That's fine. So when I do an, a data connection, what I get is um, I get this import data piece here, and so instead of bringing this into a table and actually bringing it into Excel, I'm going to bring this into... Um, a pivot table report. So I'm going to click OK. Let me get rid of that. All right. All right, so I'm going to come in here and I've got some information. Here's all of my stuff from the field here. And so I'm going to come over here and let's grab, uh, we want customer sales. So we're going to drag customer name into our pivot table, and we are going to grab. Now, I'm at the line item level with these because I grabbed sales line items. So I'm going to grab the extended cost from an item and bring that into there. So now I have customers and I have extended costs. But let's actually make this useful here. So I'm going to come over here and right click. And I'm going to filter this. I want to show the top 10. So I want to show the top 10 um, items by extended cost here. All right. And I'm going to clean this up. This is just ordinary Excel. I'm going to sort this largest to smallest. And let's do some basic formatting. We're building a dashboard, not a report. So I certainly don't need pennies. I could actually even just go to thousands. I don't need to go even that far, but we'll just leave this here for now. And I'm going to give myself a little room. All right, so now I have top 10 customers by sales. 
So that's kind of useful to me. I don't really understand what this is yet, but it's a start. So this is um, all of sales order processing. So this includes um, invoices, quotes, all that sort of thing. And I really, uh, returns are in here as positives, and that's really not what I want. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Let's come here and insert a slicer, which is really just a form of filtering. And I'm going to filter this by stop type. So there's my SOP type. And I really only want invoices. So we'll set that in there because we're going to use that a little bit later. So now this starts to make sense. I have top 10 invoices. All right, let me do another one. I'm kind of lazy and don't want to build another, another pivot table completely from scratch. So I'm going to grab this one and just copy it over here because I'm going to use, I'm going to reuse my data, my same data source. So it makes it really efficient from a data standpoint. And instead, we're going to grab items. So let's grab uh, item number, because item description is pretty big a lot of, in a lot of cases. We'll get rid of customers. And instead of costs, let's go down and grab quantity. There we go. And I can do the exact same thing and filter this with the top 10, and away we go. And let me resort this. All right, so now I have top 10 customers, and I have top 10 items based on invoices. So this is just kind of raw sales out. If I don't have a lot of returns or, or things like that, this is actually probably a pretty good number. Um, but I don't have a time period for this. So um, one other thing, this filter is actually changing both of these pivot tables. Uh, because I applied this slicer to this pivot table and then copied it, it went along with it. So if I actually right-click here and say Report Connection, I see both of these pivot tables are attached. Um, one more little tip, when you're building this for real and you select a pivot table, we can pop over here into Analyze and actually rename our pivot table. Uh, if you rename it, that makes it a whole lot easier to figure out what pivot table you're working with when you start looking at things like connecting in slicers. So if I name these, then when I do report connections, I can actually see really easily which ones are connected to this slicer and which ones aren't. So I want to add another slicer with some dates. I'm going to do a special slicer called a timeline. This is an Excel 2013 feature. So I'm going to drop in a timeline based on document date. And we will drag that up here. And so now I can say, because this is sample data, I can say that what I really want to see is January to March. All right, so that starts to make some sense to me. Um, I'm looking at uh, my costs, my inventory. Let's take a look at this. This filter. If I change this to April, these numbers change. My items did not. So this particular pivot table is not yet connected to this timeline. So let me go ahead and connect it here. Report connection will add pivot table two. So now everything's all connected up. Uh, one more thing I want to point out. This, these are items. These are the top 10 items. But because I have some ties, and especially because I have a tie at the end, there's actually 11 items in this list. Uh, Microsoft Excel handles ties by adding to the bottom. Uh, it's, so this, even though we said top 10, uh, the, all of the ties show up. So if there's you know, 20 of these last items, then this pivot table will grow longer. So that can be a consideration. We'll talk about that a little more as we go on here. All right, so we've used pivot tables. We've used slicers, we've used timelines. A couple other things, let's take a look at a chart. Again, I'm going to grab a copy of this. We'll drop it down here. Uh, what I'd really like to do is add um, document date now. Yeah. 
There we go. We'll add document date into the columns. So that's not particularly useful to me, seeing all the individual days. But if I here, I can actually right click and let's group this. And I want to group it by months and by years. So that if I do cross a year, I can actually tell it doesn't group the months together that way. So here, what I've got now, this is still, because I copied this, this is still connected to my other slicers. So now I have my top 10 customers, their sales over the last three months, but not just for one, not just gross for the period, I've actually got them now by month. And if I want to know a little bit more about these, so this is kind of cool. These guys, they're going up. That's definitely going up. That's headed down. I'll tell you what, let's get a better idea of the trend. So I'm going to grab this section here, and I'm going to insert a spark line. We'll grab a line. Then I can copy this down. These are clearly the types of um, these are clearly the types of trends I want to see if I'm looking at sales. I want hockey sticks that go up and to the right. You know, this is not the kind of trend I want to see. This one looks like maybe it's topped out. This one appears to have bottomed out and is coming back. Three months is a little short sometimes for some of these, but it does give you a quick hit of what your trend looks like or what your chart would look like without having to go and build a chart for every single customer, which gets really time consuming. All right, so I've got something to start playing with there. Um, one more thing before we go any farther. If I want a better look at these items, you come up here, and I can do conditional formatting. So with conditional formatting, I can say that I want data bars, and I get this nice little gradient. This really shows how much bigger the top item is and how much bigger these first few items are, even against the other items that are in the top ten. Just visually, it really kind of makes that piece stand out. All right, so let's grab a chart of this. I want to analyze just one customer at a time. So I'm going to insert, we'll do a pivot chart here, and oops, let's just do a chart. All right, and I told you I just want to analyze one customer. Oops, sorry, you do something different. Let me grab a copy of this because I just want to analyze one customer at a time. So let's do that. We will again apply a slicer to just this piece, and we'll do it by customer. Uh, customer name. And we'll drop that in here, and let's say that I want to analyze Plaza 1. So I can pop down and grab Plaza 1. Oops, Plaza 1. And I'm going to drop a chart on top of this. So let's insert uh, a nice chart here. All right, so that's kind of a, a decent starting point. I need to make an adjustment because I want to look at, I want to make some guesses. So if I right click on this and hit select data, I want to flip my rows and columns here. So this gives me my dates along the bottom and my customer here. We'll drag this back in. And now I can right click here and say that I want to add a trend line. And what a trend line does is it's going to show you the trend that's going on and we can even predict forward. Now, I like a logarithmic trend line for this because they tend to smooth out over time. They don't go up forever or down forever. Um, sales folks like the exponential because that's how they think their sales go. They're going to grow exponentially forever. We know that's not the case in the real world. So I'm going to grab a logarithmic to start with. And then down here, I can actually forecast forward, and I'm just going to put in a couple of periods. All right, making sure we're still going on here. So I can forecast forward and enter there. 
And so it's going to make a statistical guess on where my sales are going over the next two periods. I can actually have multiple of these. So if I want to add another trend line and do this as a linear line, I can also go forward two periods. And so here's my linear line. There's my logarithmic line. I can get a feel for where those two are going, make some guesstimates. If I want to do another company, um, you know, we've got uh, kind of blue yonder airlines here. Let's see what they look like. Again, I'm not sure that three is, is really always enough months to do a great trend, but certainly if you have 12 months worth of data uh, or, you know, six months worth of data, you can actually make a pretty good guess at the trends. And uh, honestly, this is sample data. So sometimes you get some weird stuff, but that kind of gives you an idea. All right, so last thing, let's go ahead and grab this. And to get an idea of my item mix, I'm going to drop this down here. We are going to come back to our pivot table, and we're also going to throw in doc date here. Because I grouped it up here, it knows that it's grouped and it's doing the same thing for me. And I'm going to use my conditional formatting. We're going to highlight this all. And we're going to do use color scales to do a heat map. So based on this, um, Excel splits this out into thirds, top third, middle third, bottom third. So top third is green, middle third is yellow, and bottom third is red. And then the closer you get to the top, the brighter green or the darker green it gets. The closer you get to the bottom, the darker red it gets. And so this is interesting because we see clearly, um, oops, I really didn't want the grand total. Let me clear that. There we go. So we can see March was considerably better than, than January, you know, 39 for this particular item versus 3 in January. But the key is at a glance, I can look at this and say, okay, these are the items that have done well, and this is the period in which they've done well. So that's kind of the idea behind that. So I don't know, we've been at this 20 minutes actually building a dashboard, and we've got a pretty good start. We're not quite there yet, but we've got top 10 sales by customer. We've got, uh, whoops, let me get some more room here. We've got top 10 sales by item for the last three months based on invoices. We've got um, customers over the last three months by months with uh, a graphical indicator of how they're doing. We can look at and predict against individual uh, customers. And we've got an idea of what our item mix looks like. Not a shabby place to start for 20 minutes. Hey, Mark, we have a few questions. Um, would this sure. be a good time to, to get into those? Okay. This, would, this would be great. All right. Uh, so uh, first question, is there an Excel table reference for GP uh, for GP10, or are they similar? Um, there should be one for 10, but it's going to be very similar to the 2010 one. There were not a lot of table changes. All right. Is the data connection read-only? The data connection is read only. You can only pull data out of out of GP and into Excel. All right. Um, earlier on, um, uh, Greg wrote that uh, he was unable to see how you connected Excel to GP just due to some screen latency. Is that something you could show again? Sure. So inside of GP, there. So here I'm in Sales. Typically, you would see this Sales um, window here. So in the navigation list on the left, we've got Excel reports. So they do have to be deployed. If yours aren't deployed, your, your partner can help you, or you can look it up on the web. They, they take five minutes to deploy. And we'll talk just a bit about security at the end. So I went and found the one that I wanted. Um, yeah, Mark, case, you should mention, was, I'm sorry, when, you, when you're doing your desktop sharing, it sounds like you're hitting sort of a bandwidth limit, and you're, you break up a little bit. So I would. Uh, uh, okay. Pause on whatever part you want to make sure folks see. Okay. So from here, it's just a matter of clicking on the specific, um, the specific item. And when I do that, Excel is going to launch with data.
Anything else along the way? Uh, yeah, one other question here. Since returns and credits are stored as positive numbers and can throw numbers off, is there a way to display them or have the power pivot uh, table treat them as negative numbers? Uh, so there are two things. Well, we haven't even made it to power pivot. So just in ordinary Excel, um, you can separate them out and do their own charts, do a chart for returns and just leave it all positive. So that's one way. You could bring the data into Excel and add your own column at the end, and if then, that would make them positive or negative. That works just fine. But then there's also a set of, um, when we're looking at a pivot table here, you can actually do a formula in a pivot table. So here we could actually come and do a calculated field. So this is a calculated field inside the pivot table that could figure out a return versus or a, a credit versus a, um, a sales transaction, for example. All right, a couple more that have come in, if that's okay. Sure. How do you filter the data that comes into the Excel table? If you're using refreshable Excel reports, you really can't. Um, it's possible to do it with an ODBC connection, but that's kind of more advanced than what we're going to do today. Um, you basically just get everything, which is why I prefer to bring it into memory rather than to bring it actually into Excel. Um, however, just to be clear, if you slim down the view, um, I've actually, we'll, we'll look at a dashboard later on that runs off of um, the refreshable Excel report view, and basically I just removed a bunch of the fields that I don't use, and it refreshes um, sales order transactions. Uh, we've tested it with a company that has three million sales order transactions, and it refreshes in about 30 seconds, which is um, reasonable for most folks in terms of a refresh. Okay, and uh, this next question, you might have just touched on it, but why not use um, Power Pivot to hit views, um, then GP isn't needed, um, if you have proper, assuming you have proper permissions? Um, absolutely no reason not to use Power Pivot, other than a lot of folks don't have it, um, still don't have it. They're still using Excel 2010, or um, they're using one of the versions of Excel 2013 that doesn't have Power Pivot or didn't have Power Pivot included, or folks still just don't know how to use Power Pivot versus just straight Excel. Okay. Power Pivot works and, just fine. And uh, there's a question about the first example. You changed uh, to a pivot table instead of uh, did you change to a pivot table instead of Excel? And can you redo that first step again after you selected the refreshable Excel report? Sure. So if you do a data connection, if you use a data connection, your refreshable Excel report, not a report, they both get deployed. This is kind of everything, and this is someone at Microsoft built a slimmer version of it in a report. If you use a data connection, this box pops up that says import data. And the trick is rather than picking table to actually bring it into Excel, you pick pivot table report, and that way it holds it in memory rather than placing it in an Excel sheet. If you were to check add this to the data model, it would actually bring it into Power Pivot then on top of that. All right, and another uh, review here. Um, I didn't catch how to bring the data into a view. Could you quickly review that? So the, the views are already pre-built from Microsoft, and when you pick, when you send something from a refreshable Excel report into Excel, it's using that underlying view. Okay, that's, if I'm, um, I'm sorry. Just sort of a quick, if I'm in my Excel sheet, so all of this happened as part of the refreshable Excel report piece. It's kind of invisible to folks. I've actually, there's actually a connection that gets done here, and so, this is the connection. It points to a, a connection file that is connected to the view. In this case, the view is actually called sales line items. So it's grabbing that entire view right there. Uh, and if you bring it in this way, is it live ongoing data? It is live ongoing data. And uh, Patricia asks, how can we build our own query? Um, if you, um, maybe a 
little bit more for more than what we can get into too much here. But if you build your own view and give folks permission to it, um, inside of Excel, if you bring that in as a connection and export it as a connection file, that creates a file called an ODC connection. If you put that in the exact same place on the network as all of the other Excel reports, you can actually see it inside of um, GP. Or you can just access it directly through Excel. So an awful lot of folks start with the GP view, they make some changes to it, and then they save it. And you just, um, from, from there, it's really all Excel stuff at that point in time to just connect to the view. Uh, I'm only seeing one other question right now. It's asking about Excel Report Builder. Um, can you use that to create these reports? Yes, you can. Excel Report Builder is another way. It creates its own view behind the scenes, but a, a, an Excel Report Builder-based report works exactly the same as this does. All right. Uh, we are through the question queue at this point. All right. So let's let's then get to the stuff that makes this really cool here. So all we did, we did pivot tables, we grouped our dates, we did conditional formatting for um, sort of highlighting data and building a heat map, we did spark lines to give us an idea of individual customers, we did a chart with a trend, and then we did slicers as a filter for all of those pieces. All right, so let's talk about a couple of other things. The, the fact that I have a um, Excel sheet that has what I want on and looks kind of cool doesn't mean I have a dashboard. There is at least one more thing you have to do before you, I will let you say that you have a dashboard. And frankly, if you sit through here and you don't do this thing, this is the one thing you must do. If you don't do this, I will get your email from Jason and I will hunt you down. So let me show this off here. To really make this look like a dashboard, what we need to do is come in here to view and turn off grid lines. That item alone removes that Excel feel to it and really makes this thing look more like a dashboard. Now later on, if you want to remove the, the headers or hide the formula bar, all of that's fine. You'll do that last anyway but really, really remove the grid lines. Uh, I was talking to someone, and they were actually, they, they had told me a story. It was a partner who'd been dealing with a customer, and someone at the customer built an Excel report similar to what we did here, but they left the grid lines in. And they were making an argument that the company should be using Excel instead of going out and spending a lot of money on a BI product. And when the senior exec saw the grid lines, it turned them off so much that they chose to go and spend the money on a BI product. So really, you really need to come and make sure that you turn this piece off. And then after that, we really want to just do our best to make this look good. I don't pretend to be a graphic designer. The marketing folks will help you if you buy them lunch because they've never had lunch bought from an accounting person. Um, but if you need a little help, go get it. But a couple of things that, and we'll, we'll look at some examples here. Uh, a couple of things that work really well. Insert your company's logo. Everybody likes a logo. Um, everybody loves to see their logo. Execs love to see their logo. If you can walk through an airport with a CEO and his logo's on the wall and he doesn't stop to look at it, something's wrong. It just, it's sort of the way they're wired. So I'm just going to grab something here. Um, this is not spectacular. Um, I'm just kind of grabbing whatever I can in order to, uh, to drop this piece in. Oops. All right. So that one's not good. How about the uh, smiling star here? All right. Not the best looking logo ever, but hey. So we're going to drop this here in the middle. Um, you do want to title it at some point, so I'm going to call this my uh, Fabricam, and we'll call this our sales dashboard. Um, 
clean this up just a little. Again, I'm not promising that this is fantastic, but we can do colors and that sort of thing. So in addition, let's start with maybe a background. Something that works pretty well is to put just kind of a pastel pale background in here. So maybe a, a little green or a baby blue. Uh, you know, if you're having a, a rough quarter, please try to pick something that's kind of relaxing to folks. Maybe that'll make them feel a little better along the way. You can use, um, so let me get rid of this. You can use a background, a full bleed background. I don't recommend it. We'll look at one example where someone did a really good job. But you know you don't necessarily want to come in here and do a, a full blown picture on the background. It tends to make things really hard to read. So let me just grab a picture here. Um, nature's pretty safe. Um, oops, sorry, I got to get it from someplace else. The way you do that is you go to page layout and you. See it if you want a background. Let's try that again. Uh, all right. Uh, if you have a colored background at all, it will override that. So let me, I made it white instead of no fill. So no fill. All right, so that's pretty hard to read. Even if I fiddle with these, that's going to be pretty hard to read. Although you can, for example, it's just Excel, so you can come in here and highlight these with background items to make them stand out, something like that. In addition, all of these elements, the slicers, the pivot tables, if all the slicer here and come into options, I can change this to other color. I can also do a bunch of things to um, in size and properties. I can do things here. Uh, hey, Mark, sorry. we've been losing anyway. your audio for about the last uh, 10 seconds or so. OK. So let me just sort of leave that here. We can do a lot of adjustments with this in terms of color, making them bigger, smaller. We can make the bars at the top disappear, make them go away. Um, there's a ton of functionality in terms of customizing this. So don't be afraid to really try to make this match you know, your company's color scheme. I do want to uh, get rid of. my background here, because that's really annoying. Oops. All right, that's a little better. Um, a couple of other formatting things here. Charts versus pivot tables. Um, we're going to spend a minute on that, so let me go ahead and go there. As an, this is a this is not an Excel-based dashboard. This is a um, this is a company called uh, ViewPost. They do a dashboard type of thing that plugs into GP. It lets customers and vendors see their um, see their balances in GP. It links it. It's all free, but it's all on the web. the The point of this is. They could lay this out any way they want. And what they did was they laid a chart on top, detail on the bottom. This is a format that works really well for Excel-based dashboards because it gives pivot tables and other information room to shrink and grow. And charts, which tend to be very, very fixed, they shrink and grow inside the chart box. Um, they work really well if you're trying to contain your elements. So part of my point around this is, even though these guys are not constrained by Excel, they're using a set of rules that also work really well inside of Excel. So let's take a look at some. Um, pivot tables shrink and grow horizontally. So you want to you want to put them in a place where they're not going to run into each other or into other things. Because if I add 
if I if my users add months or other things to it, I want to make sure that we're not destroying the look and feel of this. So you're going to want to play with that. Um, Mark, is this a good time to bring in some questions? Yeah, let's tackle some questions. All right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, someone who has your GP 2013 and Excel 2013 um, dashboard book, um, yeah. are there any areas uh, in there that go over some of these points that you just covered in the last section? Um, there is. There are some pieces in there. I didn't spend a ton of time on that, but there there are some pieces in there around that. Yes. Um, all right. Are you? Uh, can you show how to link Excel to Word and still be refreshable? Um, probably not within the scope of this, but that's something that mm -hmm. we can maybe look at tackling. Another kind of scope-related question here. Is there a preferred way to move this dashboard to an intranet site, or is that uh, outside the scope? We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to the end. All right. Um, how do you group accounts, for example, all sales accounts, into one line? Uh, like a, like dimension sets and management reporter. Um, so ideally, I would use something like account category um, as a way to be able to do that. Or if you're able to do it, um, depending on what you're trying to do, you may be able to do it by using parts of the the chart. So if I'm trying to group my my items by department, I could grab just that piece of the chart in order to be able to use it inside of a pivot table. All right, and uh, can you email this file to management through email? Uh, can you email this file to management without losing the data connection? Um, if management has access to the data, meaning they're either in the they're either on the network or they are connected via VPN or something like that, and they have security, absolutely, works just fine. All right, there's uh, I think that's all the questions for now. Okay, so let me spend just a minute on security and then we'll kind of talk about some layout uh, examples. So security for this is not driven by GP. It's driven by Active Directory. It's driven by your network login. So in, inside of SQL Server, when you install GP, it creates a set of roles. They all start with RPT. So the way that you give, for example, an executive security is you go into SQL, you add that user to SQL as a, you add their Active Directory, so their network user. Um, you know, MSDW slash J Gumper would be the user. And then you just go over and there's a set of roles in security that start with RPT. So it's like RPT bookkeeper, RPT um, accountant. Those correspond to the roles in GP. And so you just check the box and give them access. So in this case, if you did, you know, um, RPT sales, and you gave someone access to that, then as you email this around the company, everybody who has access to that is able to refresh it themselves. And even if they don't have rights to refresh the report, if you save it as is, they can still do the filters. So they're still able to say, well, what does my department look like? What is my, um, what does my customer look like? What about this timeline? They just don't have the latest, they just don't have the latest underlying data. So for example, if you were to put this in a place where folks could access it every day, even if they don't have the rights to refresh it, as long as you're refreshing it and putting it someplace once a day, then they're still able to play with it and interact with the information. All right, let's look at some examples. Um, this is a Microsoft dashboard for GP. You can download it and install it. There's about six connections that you have to sort of put together, but the instructions are in there. Um, kind of pros and cons. It's a little um, word heavy for me. In other words, there's a lot of just data points in here. The, however, the chart here is fantastic. So this is cash flow. Cash in goes up, cash out goes down. The net cash position is the line in the middle. I think that's a fantastic use of a dashboard from a cash flow standpoint. Again, this is one you can download for free and just plug into your GP. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, a guy wrote a book on the U.S. national debt, and he used Microsoft Excel to do the analysis. What I love about this is 
He's stuck. This is a, a graphic that goes on the top back. So this is like a full bleed picture, but it only goes part way. It's like using a wallpaper border in your house rather than wallpapering the whole thing. Charts can lay on top of that. And then he has his pivot tables at the bottom. Same thing we looked at for view posts. Um, very same technique. Charts at the top, pivot tables at the bottom works really well in an Excel environment. Um, and on top of that, folks get their first glance and they can sort of see the visual trend and then they can go down deeper for more information. This uses the exact same things we looked at. There are slicers, there are charts, there are pivot tables. We didn't even make it in this one into um, some of the other elements we looked at and it all still works really, really well. Um, up next, this is a, um, this is a product that I have available for folks. You can buy it and just plug it into GP. It's one data connection. It's very similar to what we're using here, but I, to what we built today, but I intentionally tackled this with charts because I didn't want my items to move around. So this one is very chart-based and chart-heavy in terms of delivering the information. So instead of using conditional formatting to highlight stuff, I use some charts to kind of lay that out. But I really kind of wanted to highlight three different techniques of dashboards. They're all Excel-based, and they all just present the information a little differently here. All right, so again, just some techniques and tips. You'll build your first dashboard. I've had people kind of go through this with me. They walk out of a session, they go back to their office, and they build a dashboard in an hour. But lots of people come back and say, hey, this stuff actually really works. Once I spit that out of GP and started playing around with uh, pivot tables, it was really easy to do. After you build that first one, um, you'll realize there are a few things that you need to change on some of the refreshable Excel reports. One of them is if you have millions of records, you're going to need to slim down what's in the view. So you can still start with that view, but really just pick the record, the highlight just the ones you need and either reduce that, so say select just these items from the view or get someone to help you and say, I have this view and I have these items and I need a select statement that will give me just that. A SQL guy can write that in about five minutes. Your partner can help you with that in easily under a billable hour. Um, so, you know, you think about what a billable hour is versus going out and buying a product or something or having your partner build it for you. So even if you need a little help to get that little piece, it's still uh, uh, really cheap to make that happen. Um, it's beyond the scope of this, but it is covered in the dashboard book. It is possible to, instead of using the, um, the refreshable Excel reports, use a native SQL connection that does not allow you to put in your own parameters and return less data. An ODBC connection into that same view will let you do that. So that's documented in the book and it's documented in the web and lots of places. You can actually put, for example, your dates in your Excel sheet and bring back just those, just data for those dates. But from a beginner standpoint, that's harder to do and harder to learn. From a getting started standpoint, the refreshable Excel reports are still the world's easiest thing to get started. Somewhere down the road, we had some folks ask about custom views. If you do a custom view, you can add that to the RPT role in SQL. I'd really encourage you to do that because it makes security around that much, much easier for someone to manage, someone who is not maybe um, really savvy when it comes to SQL Server. All they need to do is be able to give permission to that. And then kind of beyond this, Power Pivot is a tool that will let you do even more than what we have here, especially if you need to transform the data or if you really have millions and millions of rows. Um, in terms of doing things like managing negatives, it does a great job of, of being able to do that with respect to returns or credits. Um, but really what I wanted to do with this was say, you don't need a bunch of special stuff to get started. What you really need is Excel and GP, and you really kind of grow from there. This is sort of starting like, uh, when you first learn to drive, you get your parents take you out and you go play at the go-kart track. Or then um, then maybe they give you the keys to the car and they sit next to you and you go drive around in an empty parking lot on a Sunday a little bit. We're, we're really sort of getting folks acclimated here to be able to learn to build something. And then at some point, you'll be off and running with the family car. 
Um, a couple other things, Power BI and OneDrive. So OneDrive allows you to take this dashboard, put it up on the web. Your folks won't be able to refresh it, but they will be able to interact with it. So if you could just copy a new, refresh it and copy a new one up there every day, have an intern do that, it's kind of no big deal. Um, that works really, really well. Yeah, if you would like to deploy these to SharePoint, SharePoint has a set of Excel services. They will let you um, deploy Excel files up there, and that includes um, being able to refresh the files. You will probably need your SharePoint guy to really manage that, but it is an option. It's also an option to deploy the refreshable Excel reports to SharePoint and make those available in your SharePoint library. The last thing is Power BI, which is now the Power BI website is now free for most things. Um, it does not include auto-refresh yet, but it will connect to an Excel file, so you can build a refreshable Excel report. Um, you still would have to click the button to do the refresh, but that's not a big deal. It is free uh, for most items that you want to do on Power BI now. This is the Microsoft's new PowerBI.com website. It, even if you want to pay for the elements that they're still building out, it is 10 bucks a month per user, which is really cheap. The beauty of Power BI is you can deploy this, deploy items there. They're available on a smartphone. They're available on an iPad. They're kind of available everywhere. Right now, my, my feeling is that Power BI is not quite ready for full-blown de deployment, but it's a great place to start playing with, and in about a year, it's going to be really, really cool. So it's kind of a nice place to get started with and do some learning with now as you're learning to build dashboards. Um, Jason, let me uh, do a couple things here at the end, and then we'll tackle any remaining questions, if that's all right. Um, if you want more help Absolutely. with this, uh, if you want more help with this, I've got a book that is Building Dashboards with uh, Dynamics GP 2013 and Excel 2013. The question I get a lot is, what about GP 2010 or what about GP 2015? It works great for both of those. Um, if you're using Excel 2010, the only thing that will, you will not be able to do is timelines because those are an Excel 2013 only feature. Uh, but you can work around that with a slicer. So all of those, the book works beautifully for that. We just wrote it with 2013 out and um, when GP 2013 was out, but it still works just fine with 2015 as well. Um, if you're looking to shortcut all of this and just plug in a dashboard, um, kind of the one I showed earlier is available. It's 199 bucks. It's about as cheap as you can get. So, you know, for the price of a, of a consulting hour for a lot of people, you can actually have a dashboard, plug it in, it takes about five minutes to run. Security is completely defined in the, in the help document there as well. So that's an option too. If you just want stuff, uh, just want some other help with GP, the 2013 or 2010 cookbook are great resources. I'm the author of those. The last but not not least, if you just want something fun to read, uh, my first novel's out, Death from Above. It's on Amazon. It's probably going to go exclusive on Amazon here uh, in a couple of weeks to uh, make it easier for some folks to get it. So that's that. I will leave this up with some reference information. And then uh, if there's any final questions, I think we're kind of at our time here since we've been taking questions throughout, but we'll tackle those too. Okay, great. There are a couple others that came in. Um, Actually, just about Power Pivot. So, um, can you pull a Power Pivot plugin to Excel 2013, and um, can you just talk about how you um, how you actually get Power Pivot? Is it included with Excel, or is third or is it third party? So, Power Pivot is included with Excel 2013, um, Office Pro Plus, whatever kind of that highest level is. If you're using Excel 2010, it is a free download. If you are using one of the other versions of Excel 2013, I'm a little fuzzy. At one point, they were offering it as a download, and it, they've, they've sort of been a mess around the uh, um, licensing around that. It is a plugin for Excel. I don't want to, um, and it basically, it shows up here as Power Pivot. I kind of don't want to crush my um, connection as we do this. But essentially, what Power Pivot does is it brings the data into memory and then allows you to build um, it allows you to manipulate that data, so it has its own formula style language called DAX, Data Analysis Expressions. So if you want to manipulate the data, make changes to it, all that type of thing, and then it lets you build pivot tables off of that inside of Excel. So if you have millions of rows, Power Pivot works beautifully. If you have data that needs a lot of um, 
maybe transformation or cleanup before you're ready to pull it in. If you want to connect uh, Dynamics GP to other data sources, um, Salesforce, CRM, something custom, Power Pivot can help you connect all of those pieces as well to give you a dashboard that, that crosses multiple products. All right, that is the end of our question queue, so I think we can start wrapping up here, Mark. Um, yeah, thanks again for taking the time to, to present so much information to us, and, and yeah, for everyone on the, on the line, um, I've heard a ton of folks say good things about all these different materials that Mark has created over, over the last couple of years here, so definitely check out the dashboards, uh, the books, uh, all of it. Uh, we are recording today's event. We'll make that available soon. When you exit today, guys, please um, be on the lookout for a quick survey that pops up. We really appreciate the feedback on the session, on the uh, the platform. I know our speakers do as well. It's only take 15 or 20 seconds. Uh, with that, uh, Mark, let me just say thanks to you once again, and uh, thanks to the audience for attending today. And yeah, thanks, everyone, conclude. for coming. We really appreciate you being here. Absolutely. And that will conclude today's session. Bye.